O thou in whose presence my soul takes delight, Are those words real to you? Let's sing, let's read. We've sung that. Let's read it. Psalm also is a song. Psalm 16. Verse 11. Psalm 16, verse 11. Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Is this reality to you? In thy presence, in God's presence, is fullness of joy. The majority of religionists in this world do not regard the presence of God as a joy. They're scared of Him. There's another beautiful song, Song of Solomon 2. Song of Solomon 2, verse 4. And it says, of him, God, Jesus. It says, He brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. I have observed over the last 50 years of my experience in Christianity a rare display of such love among Christians of all denominations. That people are really enjoying God. Oh, they enjoy their meetings and they enjoy their social into activities, but to enjoy God. I don't see much of that. How would such a love that is portrayed in these hymns, in these Psalms and Song of Solomon, how would such a love be displayed by those who claim they love God? How would it be displayed? Well, here is an interesting quote that I will use so that you don't think I'm saying this, although I believe it very dearly. But here in Testimony, Volume 2, page 262, I read how such a love would be displayed if they really took pleasure in the presence of God and found great joy there. Here is how it would be revealed. It says, Many profess to be on the Lord's side, but they are not. The weight of all their actions is on Satan's side. By what means shall we determine whose side we are on? How shall we know, in other words, whether God is really my pleasure and my delight? How do I know? The answer comes here. 
who has the heart? With whom are our thoughts? Upon whom do we love to converse? Who has our warmest affections and our best energies? If we are on the Lord's side, our thoughts are of Him, and our sweetest thoughts are of Him. We have no friendship with the world. We have consecrated all that we have and are to Him. We long to bear His image, to breathe His Spirit, to do His will and please Him in all things. And as I read that, let us contemplate for a moment. When we leave this precinct, and we are out there after we have spent time listening and meditating on God, what do you talk about? Are your thoughts totally captivated with the Lord? Or are we talking about other things and thinking about other things? If in His presence is my pure delight, then according to this, the heart is occupied with him. My thoughts are totally wrapped up with him. And my conversation is on him. I love to converse of him. My warmest affections, my best energy, are totally wrapped up with Him. My sweetest thoughts are of Him. Friends, this has not been my experience in general Christianity and in general Adventism. How many times as a youth I would sit through the sermon and I used to think, oh, this is beautiful. And I went outside and I wanted to talk to my friends about what the beauty of that message was and they became uncomfortable. And I was bewildered. I thought, I've just, I just want to talk of this beautiful thing and all that they can talk about is what happened during the week, what they were going to do next week and all about themselves. And I thought, there's something wrong here. And not only have I found that with my friends in my youth, I found that with ministers. After the sermon was over, oh, how did you go last week? What is this? And what's that? And I thought, am I a lone goer around here? Adventism, as well as Protestantism in the other churches, has one big dilemma. There is a profession of godliness. But the power of it is not there. I read in Testimony, chapter, uh, volume 4, on page 395, Testimony, Volume 4, page 395. <clears throat> 
Reading there in paragraph 4, it says, It is a sad fact that the reason why many dwell so much on theory and so little on practical godliness is that Christ is not abiding in their hearts. They do not have a living connection with God. Many souls decide in favor of the truth from the weight of evidence without being converted. She's talking here to the ministers. Listen carefully. Practical discourses were not given in connection with the doctrinal. That as the hearers should see the beautiful chain of truth, they might fall in love with its author and be sanctified through obedience. What did you just pick up on this? What is the intention of the Bible and the relationship in church fellowship and listening to the truth that they may see the chain of truth the beautiful chain of truth so that they might fall in love with the author and so be sanctified obedience. What was meant? To fall in love with the author of the Bible and of the truths that it contains. And so there is such a thing as becoming fascinated with theory as I read there. They are, conver they are brought into the faith by the weight of evidence. And, you know, we, we get convinced, yes, this is truth. And we embrace the weight of evidence. And we think, I've got the genuine article. But you may have all the weight of evidence. You might be gloating with the concept that I know the truth and I am really, really the child of God and I know not the love of close fellowship with the author of that. They do not fall in love with God. It's therefore my burden in the ministry which I have yearned to communicate to people. And I don't want to use my own words, but the words I'm going to read are my own heart's desire. And it's written here in heavenly places. In heavenly places, page 354. Reading there in paragraph 2, it says, in heavenly places 3.54, it says, It is our privilege. We have the prize. Will we fight the battles of the Lord? Will we press the battle to the gate? Will we be victorious? I have decided that I must have heaven. I have decided that I must have heaven. And I want you to have it. Search the Bible for it tells you of Jesus. I want you to read the Bible and see the matchless charms of Jesus. I want you to fall in love 
with the man of Calvary, so that at every step you can say to the world around you, His ways are ways of pleasantness, and all His paths are peace. When you fall in love with somebody, don't you, don't you just love talking about them? And don't you express the joy that is there in His presence? And you want the world to know this beautiful relationship. And this is what the author of these words was affecting her. That she would want the people to fall in love. And these words are echoed from my own heart, brethren and sisters. Those very words, I want you to fall in love with the man of Calvary, are my words to you as well this morning. I have realized how difficult it is for human beings to fall in love with someone that they do not see with their eyes. They do not hear audibly with their ears. They do not physically touch him. Therefore they say, I need someone human to love. I need someone human to fall in love with. And this is what they have said to me over the years of ministry. Yes, 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 I can see what you're trying to say, but I need someone. And I'm not f happy until I have found that somebody. What I have said to them, and sometimes it sounded like I was condemning them, but it wasn't a condemnation. I said, if you want to find love with another human being, you first have to fall in love with Jesus Christ. Because anything else will fall and fail miserably. Over the years, I have tried hard to communicate a message by which the congregation could pick up on this falling in love with Jesus Christ, with whom I have fallen in love. I am in this ministry not because of what I have been trained to do, I am in this ministry because I have fallen in love with God. And it is my heartthrob desire that people around me will find this love relationship so that what we read in Psalms, what we read in Song of Solomon would be their experience as well as mine. And I have discovered that in my effort, I have frequently fallen short of gaining this objective. There were occasions in my experience where my heart throbbed with joy because certain people were, were getting it. And I still remember that with heartache today. As I was working in the ministry of the reform movement there in New Zealand, and I was trying to get these things across to the people. And there was a family with ch three children. And not only was I trying to reach out to the, to the father and mother, but I was trying to reach to the children. And as I, they were about, from about um, uh, 12 to 15, 16 years of age. And, and I was trying to reach out for them, and I, I succeeded. It was beautiful. I showed them the beautiful Jesus through the Word of God, through the Steps to Christ in the book, Steps to Christ. And they were beginning to find it. And they were, they were quite worldly in their ways, but 
as they were coming to Jesus, they could see. And there was this young lady and there was this young man. He was only 12, roughly. And he used to go out canvassing with me because he was finding something. But he was still worldly and he had his toys, his wooden toys. They were guns. They were toys of a of warfare material. And as we were sharing, as I was sharing him the, the love of the Lord, one day I walked out and he was sitting there over his toys. And there was smoke. And I came up close to him and I looked him in the face and tears were streaming down his eyes. And he was burning his toys because he had fallen in love with Jesus. And it only took another few years of religious conflict and argument that destroyed it in his life and in the life of his sister who also was showing these beautiful responses of love to Jesus. You know, there's something that really wells up in my heart. That man, adults, ministers and churches destroy the love of Jesus in the hearts of the people because of their combat, because of their pride of knowing truth, so-called. So, It has been my effort to try and bring that beautiful pearl of great price before the people so that they would fall in love with that. Now I want to read it here. This is one of my instructions in the ministry, in the book Evangelism. Evangelism, page 186. In paragraph 2 and 3, I read this. This was precious to me when I first came across it because to me, the beauty of the truth sparkled and shone. And how can I get these beautiful sparklings across to the hearts of the people so that they would regard Jesus as their treasure? Here it says, It should be the burden of every messenger to set forth the fullness of Christ. When the free gift of Christ's righteousness is not presented, the discourses are dry and spiritless. The sheep and the lambs are not fed, said Paul. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. He wasn't just an orator. But in demonstration of the spirit and of power. There is marrow and fatness in the gospel. Jesus is the living center of everything. Put Christ into every sermon. Let the preciousness, the mercy, and the glory of Jesus Christ be dwelt upon until Christ is formed within the hope of glory. Let us gather together that which our own experience has revealed to us of the preciousness of Christ and present it to others as a precious gem that sparkles and shines. Thus will the sinner be attracted to him who is represented as the chief among ten thousand and the one altogether lovely. 
brothers and sisters, this statement I picked up very early in my ministry. And this has been my burden. But I was horrifyingly disappointed that people were not picking up the sparkles and the joys of the presence of Jesus Christ in his fullness. So that when we came out of our messages, the thing that, we, that people got involved in was not the preciousness of Jesus, but the, the arguments of doctrine. And I was bewildered over the years of ministry in the reform movement where I would share God's word because I loved him, but I was thrown into doctrinal combat. And I said, Lord, what do I do here? I don't want to get caught into combat. You know, that beautiful subject of the atonement of Christ, the nature of Jesus, in all its beauty, it just sparkled and shone. And the ministers and certain members of the church brought me face to face with conflict that I had to defend a doctrine which was so plainly written out in Scripture. And it turned bitterly sour. And I nearly lost my own joy. And I still remember the day when I had to leave the church that was arguing the doctrine. I said, if you take away this beautiful message of Christ and his righteousness in the atonement and the nature of Jesus, you will destroy me. I had to lay down the beautiful things that sparkled and shone. I had to bring out mere doctrine to the church, mere doctrine of laws and rules and regulations, which did never bring the love of Jesus into the hearts of the people. So this morning, I am making a very direct attempt, once more, to display what it is that sparkles and shines. To, and I plead with you, I see some people going to sleep amongst us. Wake up! This is no sleeping time. This is life and death. Please, take it seriously. The sparkling gems of truth that you miss will dampen your relationship with Jesus. You wonder and I wonder why we have troubles in the church? It's because we are not listening to the beauty of Jesus. And let us follow very attentively now that we will pick up some sparkles and joys in the presence of God that will impact me and I will not be able to stop talking about it. This is my prayer. That I might find a deeper, intimate, bosom relationship with Christ. But beware of the fact, that's why I just mentioned, don't go to sleep now because there are many things that after you have seen a few little glimmers, a few little joys of what the Lord wants you to have, because iniquity abounds around us, the love of many grows cold. What did Jesus have against the Ephesus church? What was it? You have something against you because you have lost your first love. This is possible. This is a reality. And we want to understand what are the things that cause me to lose the first love. So what is meant by falling in love with Jesus? What is meant by that? I have four points that I want to, in the time that I have, to do my best to play out before your mind. 
but I've only got a short time. One is to be charmed by the mind that is behind the Bible. I want to enlarge that. Secondly, to be charmed by the fulfillment of prophecy. Thirdly, to be charmed by the demonstration of God's character. And finally, to be charmed by the gospel. The word charm, you know what it means. It means to become so occupied with it that it thrills my every soul, my, my every part within my soul. So let's go. The first point, to know what it means to fall in love with Jesus. To be charmed with the mind behind the Bible. I'm reading here a statement from Pamphlets 152, PH 152, on page 35, paragraph 1, it says, Let the truth of God be the subject for contemplation and meditation. The Bible is God's letter to man in which is instruction as to how to become rich in heavenly graces to secure for the believer the life that shall measure with the life of God. So what, are we, what is the Bible there? It is the letter from God. What's that? The love letter from God. He, is, he has inspired the writing of the Bible as a letter from Him. You know what it's like. Can you often express yourself, your inmost soul, by talking to somebody? Can you manage very well? But have you tried to do it by writing? Can you do it better that way? I had a situation like that. The person who wanted to communicate with me had great trouble telling me by looking me in the eyes. But they wrote it in writing and then I saw their heart. Oh. God is written, has caused to be written a love letter that by the words that are written there, we will discover his inmost motivating love. To study the Bible, and that's what we read, didn't we? To behold the chain of intelligent connectivity running through the scriptures. It charms you when you see that beautiful chain of truth and you will fall in love with its author. To fall in love with the author of the word is to take the word not merely to prove the doctrine but to see the beautiful mind of God. To appreciate his mind that has caused this connection. And as you look through the connections, it, you go, wow, what a mind I've got here. Let's go there to Isaiah 28 and see what God is actually saying. Isaiah chapter 28. Verses 9 to 12. Isaiah 28. Verses 9 to 12. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Remember the words of Jesus? This is life eternal that they might 
No. No what? No God and Jesus Christ. This is life eternal. So whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. What is the refreshing? By reading here a little and there a little and discovering the mind that has put these precious gems, these precious communications here and there throughout the Bible and as you see them coming together as a wonderful connective message, you go, wow, you fall in love with the author. That's what it's meant for. But can you see how easy you can miss that when you get into conflict with doctrine, with trying to defend doctrine? You will miss the point because you're so focused on proving what you believe is right that you miss the beauty of this mind that connects the scriptures from one part of the Bible to the other. I have been charmed with this from the age of 12. And it brought my heart to the Lord. And I was disappointed that the ministers were missing it. And haven't you felt this in the past as I tried to connect the scriptures together on different subjects that we have studied? Have we not felt in our past research the amazing experiences of Daniel and Revelation, of Isaiah and Ezekiel, and all these beautiful connecting things so that we could see, wow, he, this, this is truth. I know it is. And this is what caused the hearts of the disciples to burn within them when they were so disappointed that Jesus was, had hung on the cross and died. Let's come over to this beautiful concept, Luke chapter 24. <clears throat> Luke 24 reading there verses 44 to 45. There they were walking with Jesus and they didn't realize who it was. And then they, Jesus came to the upper room. And I'm reading there from verse 44 and 45 where he was in the upper room. And he said, he said unto them, verse 44, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you. Jesus has even failed to help them. They had been totally occupied with their own opinions. How careful must we be? That all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Oh, yeah, that's right. The Psalms, remember how they connect in through the Bible? Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. What did he do? He went from... Psalms, to the prophets, to, to all the scriptures. And as they were getting it, they go, oh. And what was the words of, the, of those that he did it to on the road to Emmaus? Just jump across to verse 32. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures. The way that the truth unfolds from one scripture to the next to the next. How inspiring. And how they fell in love with this mind. That had written, inspired the scriptures over 1600 years. And what? It all fits together. What a mind. Brethren and sisters, I'm charmed with that. Are you? 
This is what causes you to fall in love with the author. Then we come to prophecy. The fulfillment of the prophecies that we have studied, all those prophecies, Daniel and the Revelation, the, the empires, all that, remember, was written long before it happened. And you know the part that really, really got me more than any other part was Daniel chapter 11. That hard prophecy to work your way through it. And in my early years as I was listening to the preaching by the old Adventist ministers who still had the prophecies right. And I was listening there at nine years of age and I was thrilled, enthralled. I thought, wow, this is amazing. I learned to love God through listening to those difficult passages that they were unfolding. And I could see it was true. And then the thought came upon me, but how can I ever remember all that? And the precious Lord drew near and said, don't worry about remembering it, just enjoy it. Did you hear that? Don't worry about remembering it, just enjoy it. Because when you enjoy something, do you forget it? No. You can't help but remember. And this is the reason why I remember things, because I enjoy them. You've never seen me much, and, I, and I've never done it all through my, my training to take notes in sermons. Never did. Not until... I had to do my, my nurse's training and there I had to learn homiletics and the doctrines and things like that. Then I took notes because I had to pass exams. And I never did as well remembering by rote than by enjoyment. When I enjoyed things, then I passed my exams much better. So Jesus said, don't worry about that you have to be able to bring all this out later on. Leave that to me. Just enjoy. Enjoy what you're discovering here. And wow, yes. What happened when you study the prophecies and you see them all fulfilling? And how the scriptures connect with those prophecies. You know, the 2,300 day prophecy. Oh, how burdensome people make that study. Too much all at once. And you go there, you try to swallow hard, you try to digest it and enjoy it, and it overwhelms you. That's why many of my friends in the Adventist church I went to school with, they all said, what's the use of all those prophecies? We just want to follow, we just want to know Jesus. I thought, well... And that was the very words that was uttered by a minister to his son. Don't worry about Daniel chapter 11. Just concentrate on Jesus. And I loved the way he answered. But Tad, I found Jesus in Daniel chapter 11. Why? Because Jesus was demonstrated in the prophecies that were unfolding. And he came right on time. And, then, and, and uh, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. As you go through the prophecy, you see there in 457 BC, the, when the, and, and people have trouble sorting out the, the starting date, when by reading carefully it's so easy. But it can be cross-checked, because there it talks about Jesus coming as the Messiah, the Prince. He would be anointed. He would be anointed at a time of his baptism. When was that? There it is in Luke. It tells you when it was. In the 15th year of, of uh, Tiberius Caesar, you've got a historic event. In the 15th year, Jesus was baptized, and that was 27 AD. <laughs> and then there was a whole week left for the Jews. And you see how the Lord worked with that whole prophecy and you go from text to text. He was baptized at that time and at that baptism it was stated in another scripture that the Holy Spirit came upon him and anointed him. And then he went into the wilderness 
And then it says he came out of the wilderness and he said, the time is at hand. What is he talking about? A prophecy. Be, be repentant, be baptized and, and come to the Lord because the time is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is now to, to, to proceed. And the people were blank. Why? And here we are today, people are just as blank. When it can be such a thrill to fall in love with the great light of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is what? The testimony of Jesus, my Lord. Oh, wonderful. Let's read it, Second Peter ch chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Until the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts. You know what it's like in darkness, don't you? The darkness of despair. Because everything has gone wrong in our lives. Wasn't that the case of the disciples? Everything they hoped for smashed down around them. Their heavens fell. But what was it? Apostle Peter knew what he's talking about. Prophecy in the darkness is a light. And the day star arises in your heart. That's why their hearts were burning. When the day star arises in your heart, not because you were happy that now you know the prophecy, because that also makes you feel good, but that's not the goodness that you're after. You're after the day star burning in your heart. You're after falling in love with Jesus and it happens when you are occupied like that. Then, as you study the scriptures, you discover something else. That's the third point. God's character. God's character. As you read the Bible, you will discover a manifestation of God's character that absolutely spellbinds you. Let's go to Genesis. Just As I said, I haven't got time to go through every detail. But here in Genesis chapter 3, here are some little snapshots of God's character that you can fall in love with. And remembering that God never changes. He's always the same, yesterday, today and forever. And this discovery of God who is so unchangeable gives you a wonderful sense of, of harmony and comfort with him. And here he is, Adam and Eve have just sinned. Just have a look at his character, God's character. Right? It says there in verses 8. Now you read the story and it's just a story, but look at the character. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. What was that? God regularly came to talk with Adam and Eve. They held communion together. Now they had eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what's this? God could have said to himself, <coughs> Watch his character. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. They hid themselves from the presence and that's what sin has done ever after. The wonderful presence of God in which there is great joy sinners have lost. But look at his character. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art 
thou? Didn't he know where he was? Of course he knew where he was. He saw them all the time. But look at his character. Adam, where are you? I'm looking for you. Adam, where are you? Can you see the character? I fall in love with that. And Adam said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So what does God do? Yeah, I know all about that. Is that what he said? Can you see his character? What does he do? He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? The question again, he knew all about it. But he came to commune with a sinner. To show that he doesn't shun the sinner, the sinner shuns him. That's glorious to me. And then they go, the man said, the woman whom thou gavest me, stop blaming me for it. Is that what he said? No. He just let them prattle. He let them prattle. And he came home on their prattling. He asked them, now she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this? What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. And what did the Lord do in his wonderful character? And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Can you see God's character? Oh, to take time. To go beyond the story and see the character of God. And what do we read about this character who was prepared to talk with sinners whom he said, the day you eat thereof, dying thou shalt die. That's the original. People say, right, God is a person who's going to destroy them now. And of course he didn't, did he? Why not? Because that's not his character. What is his character? Psalm 9, verse 16. This is important that we marvel and become charmed by seeing his character. And our hearts are warmed toward him because we see that he is not the vindictive God that has been generated by sinful minds. John chapter, uh, sorry, Psalms 9, verse 16. The Lord is known. You want to know him? The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. In the day you eat thereof, dying you shall die. Your own action has created your self-destruction. God is a God of, of life, of salvation, not a God of destruction. In Psalm 7, you see it vividly portrayed. Verse 11. God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. And remember what angry means? Grieved. Not like a ferocious angry beast, not at all. When Jesus was angry in, in Mark chapter 2, he looked upon them being grieved. He, would, he was Grieved with the wicked every day. If I turn not, he will wet his sword. He has bent his bow and made it ready. You see, it sounds like him trying to shoot the wicked, right? 
He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. Behold, what is this now? He travaileth with iniquity and hath conceived mischief and brought forth falsehood. He made a pit and digged it and is fallen into the ditch which he made. His mischief shall return unto his own head and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pate. Oh, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. See, this person fell in love with God when he saw what God is like. And David could have seen it better than anybody else because he saw the warfares and he saw the ferocious viciousness of the wicked that wanted to kill him as well. And he said, look what happens. They, their own behavior destroys them. And that's what happened all through the prophecies of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, right through to our time. When finally, when God destroys, it's going to be the same as the destruction of Jerusalem. When Jerusalem was destroyed, how did that happen? God didn't want to destroy it. Titus did not want to destroy it. He told his soldiers, don't touch the sanctuary. He worked with them. And the ferocious antagonism of the Jews in their intensity to fight them off against all odds that even when, uh, what was the name of that Jewish? Josephus. Even when Josephus was trying to reason with them, give over to the Romans, they, said, they, they, they threw darts at him. So what was the destruction of Jerusalem? It was their own ferocious, evil nature that destroyed them. And that's what you can read in Great Controversy, page 36. And I just want to read a little snapshot from that one. Great Controversy, page 36. Very beautifully expressed here. Paragraph 1 and 2, it says there in 36. God does not stand toward the sinner as an executioner of the sentence against transgression. But he leaves the rejectors of his mercy to themselves to reap that which they have sown. Every ray of light rejected. What is that? Every ray of light rejected. Can you see how important it is to catch every ray of light and not to go to sleep? Every ray rejected, every warning despised or unheeded, every passion indulged, every transgression of the law of God is a seed sown which yields its unfailing harvest. The Spirit of God persistently resisted is at last withdrawn from the sinner, and then there is left no power to control the evil passions of the soul and no protection from the malice and enmity of Satan. The destruction of Jerusalem is a fearful and solemn warning to all who are trifling with the offers of divine grace and resisting the pleadings of divine mercy. When... God destroys. It is in grief that he takes his protection away. And what destroys him? The evil nature of the beast. That is in human nature. And that is self-destructive. That charms my heart. I love God because of that. Then comes that grand, grand, grand story of the gospel. In the study of the cross of Jesus Christ lies the deepest fountain of love erupting in our hearts. 
in general, the general beautiful picture of the gospel is beautifully expressed here in these words. And I just have this time to just touch on this. But this is what we need to occupy our meditations upon and read about it and appreciate the revelations of God's love letter in the gospel of Jesus Christ. On page 176 in God's Amazing Grace, paragraph 4, it says, When Adam's sin plunged the race into hopeless misery, God might have cut himself loose from fallen beings. He might have treated them as sinners, deserve to be treated. He might have commanded the angels of heaven to pour out upon our world the vials of his wrath. He might have removed this dark blot from his universe. But he did not do this. Instead of banishing them from his presence, he came still nearer to the fallen race. How? He gave his son to become bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. And our study into the nature of Christ is the source of falling in love with him in a deeper way than any other of these other points. That he became, he God, became bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh, and suffered the temptations, the sin of every one of us. When I read this, thank God I didn't have to do it now because otherwise I would have blubbered all over the place. But I blubbered, I fell apart when I read that in its great impact upon me when I first came across that statement, because I knew it already. In the upward look, this beautiful thing is enlarged. Page 191. When you discover God's character, you fall in love with him. When you discover the gospel, not just that God doesn't destroy anybody, but people destroy themselves. That's an amazing thing in itself. But then, people who destroy themselves, he comes close to and wants to save them out of doing it. Just think about it. Here it is. Christ might, because of our guilt, have moved far from us. But instead of moving farther away from us, he came and dwelt among us. Filled with all the fullness of the Godhead to be one with us that through his grace we might attain to perfection. He didn't want us to stay in our self-destructive path. He came close to us and we want to really relish that. Doesn't it sparkle? Doesn't it shine? Doesn't it touch your heart? Doesn't it, doesn't it attract you? It goes on. By a death of shame and suffering, he paid man's ransom. And those of you who know the study on the ransom, what a love story. What self-sacrificing love is this? From the highest excellency, he came. His divinity clothed with humanity Descending step by step to the very depths of humiliation. What was that? No line can measure the depth of this love. Christ has shown us how much God can love and our Redeemer suffer in order to secure our complete restoration. He desires his children to reveal his character, to exert his influence, that other minds may be drawn into harmony with his mind. Christ, our Savior, in whom dwelt absolute perfection, became sin for the fallen race. What? 
Oh, let that sink in. He did not know sin by experiencing of sinning, but he experienced sin. How did he do that? Because the father was a great scientific scientist who could install into his genetic chromosomes the very experience of a sinner. He could do it. And as he, God, does that to him to become bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh, to come and, and what did Jesus say? The Son of Man, when he is lifted up, what will he do? He will draw all men to him. This story is to draw your love into a, a love relationship with him that will affect you for eternity. But that's fine for general. For the general populace. Yeah, but that, that me, I'm too bad. Right? How many of you have said that? I'm too bad. Hmm? I, that's okay. Yeah, it's wonderful what he's done for the race. But me, I'm sorry, it leaves me out. And so now, let us just spend a little moment longer. The personal discovery of God in your life, of Jesus. You feel sure that your condemnation is so great as to behold not only the sins that you have committed, but the utter helplessness of your life to change. Have you tried to change? You believe that you have been, you know, forgiven, but you're not changing. And so you think, well, he have done it again. And I'm sinning again, and I'm sinning again, and what hope have I got? Jesus died for me, and I'm crucifying him afresh every time I sin. What hope do you have? Helplessness. You cannot believe that you can ever change. And the nearer you come to Jesus, the more sinful you will feel. Your mind is totally overwhelmed with a sense of total unworthiness. Just as Jacob felt. Remember Jacob's ladder, children? And Jacob's trouble. What was he feeling? Abject hopelessness. Then comes God's Spirit when you feel like that. When you see, okay, I can't even stay awake in the divine service. I'm finished. I'm done. You know? <laughs> and what does he do? He says, let's go to Isaiah 41 and let him hear, let him speak to us. Isaiah 41, verse 10. He comes to that person, no matter how many times he has failed, and he says, don't worry, I know your problems. I know your problems and your difficulties. I know them all. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear thou not. I am with thee. Didn't he demonstrate that to Adam and Eve? Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. You know how weak you are. And here he comes and he says, look, don't be afraid, stay with me. Because no matter how frail and how full of imperfection you are and how many times you have failed, I am going to strengthen you and I'm going to work with you. I will help you. I, 
with the right hand of my righteousness. What's that? Oh, what? I'm so hopeless and I can't see myself getting there and he speaks like that to me. Verse 13. Beautiful. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Fear not, thou worm. Don't you feel like one? Jacob. And you men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument, having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small and shalt make the hills as chaff. Is the mountain of your impossibility in front of you? If you stay with me, I'm going to give you such an understanding by which you're going to thresh those mountains of impossibility into chaff and the wind's going to blow it away. Try to understand it. Isaiah 44, 22. Here are his words. Every time you have sinned, every time I have failed again, what does he say? I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgression. And as a cloud thy sins return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Return unto me. In other words, don't say you're not going to make it. Don't say, Phew, finish, I'm done. He says, return to me. Instead of running away, run into his arms. He's your redeemer. Don't you love him? Isn't he wonderful? This means so much to me. Because I wouldn't be here today if this wasn't a reality to me. Remember those beautiful words of 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. Here it is. It must be applied again and again until we have turned these, these mountains of difficulty into chaff by God helping me. That I can walk with Him until He has perfected my case. And as I'm walking with Him, the nearer I come to Him, the more sinful I will see myself. Never forget that. So that's there in 1 John chapter 2. Very beautifully put here when it says, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. That's, that's exactly what's meant to be. We are not to sin. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, the one who knows the experience so well. And so, brethren and sisters, don't be despair about some of the harsh things that you read in the spirit of prophecy. Don't despair, because this, the harsh things that are written in the spirit of prophecy are not meant for the sinner who cries for help. They are meant for someone else. Let's read it here. A beautiful quote from Testimony, Volume 4, page 364. She is writing, if you read the context of this, she is writing to a man who could not control himself. He had passions that were too strong. And he kept on failing and falling into those passions. And look what she writes here, page 364, paragraph 3. This is the spirit of prophecy. My dear brother, I hope you will not become discouraged because your feelings so often master you when your way or will is crossed. Never despond. Okay, remember what you've gone through, she says. Your way and your will and your feelings got the better of you and she said you're a man of of volatile passions in the context and you are really failing badly. Don't despond. Never despond. Flee to the stronghold. Watch and pray and try again. (laughs) 
Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God. And he will draw nigh to you. Isn't that hope? That's the testimony of Jesus. That's your Jesus. That's the spirit of prophecy. That's Sister White's writings. <laughs> then it says in Steps to Christ. Steps to Christ, page 64. There are those powerful words. In paragraph 1, it says, in Steps to Christ, page 64. There are those who have known the pardoning love of Christ and who really desire to be children of God. Is that you? You've known his pardoning love for you. Yet, they realize that their character is imperfect. Their life is faulty. And they are ready to doubt whether their hearts have been renewed by the Holy Spirit. If I've got a renewed heart, why do I still have these horrible faults? Why do I still fall? To such, I would say, do not draw back in despair. We shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings and mistakes. How many times? Often. But we are not to be discouraged. Even if we are overcome by the enemy... We are not cast off. Not forsaken and rejected of God. Don't you love him? Doesn't this stir love and, and absolute amazement in your heart? No, Christ is at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. And then she quotes First John 2 verse 1. And do not forget the words of Christ. The Father himself loveth you. He desires to restore you to himself. So, you know, my right hand of righteousness, I'm going to help you. To see his own purity and holiness reflected in you. That's what his desire is. And if you, here are these important words, if you will but yield yourself to him. Is that easy when you think you're too bad? You know, is it easy to yield to think, well, yes, I'm going to trust you in, in spite of I feel so bad about myself. That's what we must do. We must yield. He that hath begun, hasn't he begun a good work in you? Will carry it forward to the day of Jesus Christ. Pray more fervently. Believe more fully. As we come to trust, as we come to distrust our own power, we come to distrust it. Let us trust the power of our Redeemer. And we shall praise Him who is the health of, my, of our countenance. The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. For your vision will be clearer and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to His perfect nature. So if you see yourself so badly, isn't that a wonderful thing? <laughs> you know, don't despair. This is evidence that Satan's delusions have lost their power. That the vivifying influence of the Spirit of God is arousing you. And here it is now. No deep-seated love for Jesus can dwell in the heart that does not realize its own sinfulness. The soul that is transformed by the grace of Christ will admire his divine character. 
What a character. This pure God. And me in such a vile state. And the nearer I come to him, the more I see his perfection, the more I see my vileness, and I feel like vomiting. And the Lord says, come. I'm changing you. Don't give up. This is him speaking. Oh, does not your heart burn within you? With a love that drives you into his arms, instead of away from him when you see yourself as you really are. And that's what it meant in 2 Corinthians 5. The love, verse 14, the love of Christ, what? Constraineth us. It drives me into his arms. That is the beauty of God's love. So, as you, comp as you embrace all these things I have shared with you here, as you behold the mind of God in the scriptures, in that beautiful connecting truth, the chain of truth, you fall in love with the author. As, you dis as the display of prophecy and its fulfillment is played out in front of you, wow, you are charmed. The display of God's character in his way of dealing with sinners that he would not destroy them they will destroy themselves that's his character he comes to them just the same and then the gospel of jesus christ puts the perfect picture into place that he comes so close to them that he himself suffers their depravity will you give yourself to such a devotion our love will never grow cold. It will become hotter and more, hot, more so, and it will lead me to a willing submission. Oh, Lord, whatever you say, I will do. I'm not going to argue with you anymore. Hmm? And then something comes and you go, Ugh, that doesn't sound right, but God said it. <laughs> Remember at Abraham? Go and take your son, your only begotten son, and slay him. <laughs> what? You know, this is the way it will appear to us many times. I mean, then when God says something, it will appear as though it is not God. This can't be the Lord. Yes, it is. He wants to make us perfect. And didn't he perfect Abraham through that experience? So whatever you know that God is saying, let him make it clear. And it takes a while because fanatics jump ahead of God. They often run into things that God hasn't meant when he said it in a certain way. They, they put their own interpretation on it. But wait for God to make it clear. And then when you know exactly that this is what God wants you to do and it might feel like taking the very lifeblood out of your heart, follow it through. And you experience God's wonderful victory. This is my prayer that we will all together fall in love with God, with Jesus Christ. And when I can see brethren and sisters and children doing that, my love for Jesus gets even stronger. I long to hear from our company the complete coping power that no matter what it is, I can forgive my brother for his sins. I can tolerate all the things that are happening around me. I'm going to do it like Joseph. I'm going to do my part right. And if anybody mistreats me, that's fine. I'm in love with Jesus. And we will have love among one another. May this be our experience, is my prayer. Amen.